Thank you for joining us on This Week in Turkey. I am Murat Tursan. Tonight, a big-name pop star is under arrest for speech. We're doing a six-month breakdown of the war in Ukraine, and we'll get Dr. Ilhan Uzga's opinion on the Turkey's role in the conflict. In other news, Turks are having a tough time getting visas for Europe, and a deceased university student is mourned by friends and the nation. Our first story tonight, Gülşen, the Turkish singer-songwriter, was taken into custody Wednesday morning when the police reportedly picked her up from her home in Istanbul. After having given a statement yesterday, she was charged and transferred to Istanbul's criminal court under orders by the district attorney, and she will be awaiting trial in prison. And her crime is one of speech, of course. In one of our concerts, Gülşen said that he must be from Imam Hatip. That's why he's perverted about an unidentified person. We don't know who this person is, and we're not aware of the full context. But what we do know is that she equated being from Imam Hatip to being a pervert. Her words, not mine. Please don't arrest me. Now, Imam Hatip, of course, are religious vocational schools in Turkey that train imams. President Erdogan is famously a graduate of one of these vocational schools. It is uncertain at this time what's going to happen to Gülşen. As of right now, she is unconvicted, and the story is sure to develop. But this is what we have so far. Pop star Gülşen is under scrutiny again, and this time not by just Twitter users, but by Istanbul's chief prosecutor. Yesterday morning, Gulshan was detained after being picked up from her home by the police. Last night, Gulshan was officially placed under arrest after the prosecutor ordered her transfer to the Istanbul Criminal Court. The pop star will be transferred to Istanbul Bakırköy Correctional Facility to await trial. The prosecution is charging the singer with inciting hatred and malice, an offense punishable by one to three years in prison. It is unclear at this time if the singer would serve prison time if convicted. After being put on blast for insulting the graduates of Imam Hatip schools by the members of the ruling party, their media, and social media users, the Istanbul district attorney ordered Gulshan to be taken into custody. Gulshan has been a controversial figure for months now for being scantily clad, twerking on stage, and brandishing the LGBT flag which had previously earned the outrage of the conservative religious community. Gulshan was detained Wednesday morning after a video of her made the rounds on social media. The video features a recent show where Gulshan jokingly says, he must have graduated from Imam Haptip school. That's why he is a pervert, about an unidentified person. Many figures in AKP lost no time in slamming the singer. AKP spokesperson Omer Chalik tweeted, Brewing hatred is not a form of art. Spewing hateful messages is not the artist's job. AKP's second-in-command, Numan Krutulmush, added, Nobody has the right to say discriminatory stuff about Imam Hatip students or anyone else. The Ministry of Education stated that they will also pursue legal action against the singer. Gulshen made a public announcement on her social media that read, I am sorry to have fed a narrative into the hands of the people who are trying to divide our people. And our main story tonight, this week marks the six-month anniversary of Russia's invasion of Ukraine that has arguably scarred Ukraine for generations to come and has caused instability around the world. And since this show is called This Week in Turkey, we'll be looking at it from a Turkish perspective. Now, Turkey has had an odd relationship with Russia, to say the least. Turkey openly supplies weapons to Ukraine, but also does not go in with the sanctions on Russia like the rest of the West. Erdogan and Putin meet quite frequently, perhaps more so than any other head of state, and their meetings are usually jovial and cavalier in mood. But the two nations are strategic adversaries. Which is to say nothing when you consider that Turkey is a full-fledged member of NATO. Now, we'll discuss the intricacies of the relationship later with Dr. Uzgad, but let's do a recap of the last six months of the war.
been six months since February 24th when Vladimir Putin ordered the invasion of Ukraine under the guise of a special military operation. Since the start of the invasion, Russia has attacked countless cities in Ukraine, including the capital, Kiev. Russia continues to get struck with sanctions while weapons and aid continue to flow into Ukraine. And the international community continues to raise concern about the massive potential nuclear disaster due to the shelling of Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. However, there was some positive news in July, where Russia and Ukraine came together in Istanbul's Dolmabacha Palace to resolve the global grain crisis. Ukrainian Infrastructure Minister Oleksandr Kubrakov and Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shaigo signed a deal between Kiev and Moscow to allow grain to once again flow through the Black Sea, destined for the global markets. I just uh, signed a request to Congress for a critical security. Since the beginning of the war, the United States has provided a total of $12.1 billion in military equipment to Ukraine. After the United States, largest military aid to Ukraine comes from the United Kingdom. Since the beginning of the invasion, the UK has provided $2.72 billion in military aid and equipment to Ukraine. Third in line is the European Union with $2.51 billion worth of equipment and aid. And among the myriad of sanctions aimed at cutting Russia off from the West, the Russian central bank's assets worth $630 billion were frozen, Russia's public assets in many countries have been blocked, and Russian banks have been removed from the SWIFT payment network, removing Russia's ability to trade. According to a report released by the UN Human Rights Council on August 24th, 5,587 civilians have been killed since the beginning of the invasion, and 7,890 civilians have been seriously injured. According to a statement made on August 22nd by General Valery Zaluzhny, the commander of the Ukrainian Armed Forces, 9,000 Ukrainian military personnel have been killed in the last six months. Russia, on the other hand, is yet to release their casualty numbers. According to U.S. intelligence, however, the Defense Department puts Russian losses at 15,000 dead and 45,000 wounded. The United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees indicates that a third of the 41 million population of Ukraine has been displaced. It is estimated that Turkey currently hosts around 145,000 refugees from Ukraine. According to reporting from BBC thus far, Ukraine's infrastructure has suffered $104 billion in damages. And just as if Turkey's position on the war wasn't confusing enough, President Erdogan made a speech this week, not only declaring support for Ukraine, but going as far enough to say that Turkey does not recognize Russia's annexation of Crimea. Now remember, back in 2014, Russia invaded and then subsequently simply took Crimea, then a part of Ukraine. This all happened after Ukraine's political revolution, where the president, Viktor Yanukovych, shelved a trade agreement with the EU and decided instead to move closer to Russia. Consequently, Yanukovych was ousted. But that did not sit very well with Russia because it triggered Russia's first invasion of the country. Then, militarily feeble, Ukraine couldn't really put up much of a fight. But of course, that's all changed now. Now, why did Erdogan choose to double down on Turkey's position now? Is there something behind the scenes? Dr. Ulgen will be with us in just a little bit to answer that exact question, but let's see what the president had to say first. Since the start of the war, Turkey had established a vague distance between Russia and Ukraine. 
never throwing its support behind Russian sanctions given Turkey's fledgling economy and dependence on Russia, but at the same time supplying Ukraine with weapons and equipment. Turkey has supplied at least 20 TB2 drones to Ukraine, at least 50 MRAP armored vehicles, discussed selling warships, has supplied an undetermined number of air defense systems, and advanced electronic jamming capabilities. But Erdogan continues to maintain a close relationship with Putin, regularly visiting the head of state. Ukraine, Devlet Başkanı, Sayın Zelensky. This week, however, Erdogan had a markedly different tone. During his speech at the Crimea Platform Online Leader Summit on Tuesday, Erdogan took a hard stance on Russia's invasion of Crimea and reiterated that Turkey does not recognize Crimea as a part of Russia. Turkey does not recognize the annexation of Crimea, deems it illegitimate and illegal from day one. The return of Crimea to Ukraine, which we see as unbreakable part of it, is the necessity of international law, Ukraine's territorial integrity and independence. Its political unity is critically important, not just for regional, but also international security and stability. Back in 2014, Russia invaded and subsequently annexed Crimea from Ukraine after the Ukrainian revolution that ousted Ukraine's former president, Viktor Yanukovych. Joining me now, Doctor of International Relations, Ilhan Ozgad. Doctor, thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure, thank you. Now, Doctor, let's start with the basics. It's been six months since the beginning of the war, and whether it likes it or not, Turkey has been a notable player in this crisis. Turkey, in rhetoric, supports Ukraine and is more than happy to sell them as many weapons as they want. At the same time, though, Turkey is openly unwilling to sanction Russia and give up its economic ties. I think it's about time to ask, what is Turkey's game here? What's the long-term strategy? Uh, which side winning the war would benefit Turkey more? What are your thoughts? Well, it's a very tough crisis for Turkey, definitely, because I mean, Turkey had already, I mean, Erdogan himself had already strong ties with Putin, personal ties with with, with Putin, which has been developed for for for many years, and Turkey had very good relations with, with Ukraine, including you know the military uh, cooperation. Uh, so the, the the war outbreak at this very moment where Turkey, when Turkey had good relations with, with Putin and good cooperation with, with, with Ukraine. So it had to balance those two countries. I think so far uh, it's not too bad. Uh, I mean, <clears throat> what I was critical of Erdogan government was that Turkey has been unnecessarily involved, became part of almost every conflict and tension stretching from Libya to for Yemen. So that was not necessary. I mean, to be part of government, because you lose uh, many instruments. Of course, you you you use your military, you, you show your military might, as a president. But <clears throat> remaining, I mean, keeping a distance in such crisis is always better, a better option than became a party to the conflicts. So in the Ukraine conflict, Turkey, is this a member of NATO? And Turkey signs the document issued by NATO claiming that, stating openly that Russia is a threat to, to, to NATO, to stability. So Turkey agrees with this terminology, agrees with this strategy. So Turkey had to, but on the other hand, as you, as you said before, Turkey had strong ties with, with Russia, I mean, including energy cooperation, military cooperation to Turkey purchased S-400 <clears throat> uh, missile system from Russia recently. Turkey, millions of Russian troops are coming to Turkey. And Russia is, is, is a, is a, is a not, not very significant uh, trade partner of Turkey, but some agricultural products that Turkey uh, exports to Russia. So under um, Turkey needs Russia in Syria. So under these circumstances, uh, it is imperative for Turkey to to maintain a balance uh, 
between uh, Ukraine and, and Russia. So on the one hand, Turkey continued with this policy of providing uh, military equipment to Ukraine, but at the same time, uh, closing down the, the Bosphorus or Russian military warships, closing down the Turkish uh, airspace space for military uh, routes, military flights. And I mean, that, that, that's, a, that's a difficult situation. But so far, and of course not complied with the sanctions. So that is as a balancing act, they try to strike a balance between Russia, Ukraine, and the West, and its NATO responsibilities. That was not something easy to do, but so far the Erdogan government somehow managed it, which is the only uh, policy that I am less critical of. Mm -hmm. I see. So, Doctor, would it be safe to say that uh, the Erdogan government would like nothing more to return to a status quo? They are not necessarily in favor of one side to another. Exactly. Of course, Turkey, in, in the end, uh, does not want Russia to be militarily successful. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a kind of a military, political, uh, in energy terms, asymmetry between Turkey and Russia already. So Turkey has been kind of encircled by Russia. Russia is, Russia is controlling Crimea now. Russia intervened in, in Georgia, controlling militarily and politically uh, South Ossetia. Uh, and Russia is in, in, in, in Turkey South, in Syria. Russia in Libya. Russia in, is in uh, Mali. So the, the, the, uh, Russia emerged as a victor from, from the Ukraine war. It's not strategic. I'm not talking about the AKP government that gone out in general. Uh, in strategic, from a strategic point of view, uh, any Russian victory in Ukraine is definitely against Turkey's strategic interests. So any, any solution to this war is, is good for, for, first of all, for, for the Ukrainian people, for the Russian people, and for Turkey. For the region itself and for the global, global and for the world at the same time. I see. So, <clears throat> in fact, this is a matter of keep your friends close, keep your enemies closer. But uh, while we're on the subject, let's move on to this. Now, Doctor, let's uh, talk about the latest developments. Very recently, President Erdogan, after having, meeting, uh, having a meeting with President Zelensky, uh, Zelensky rather, last week, said that not only does he openly support Ukrainian sovereignty over its lands, but Turkey does not recognize the annexation of Crimea. Now, as you said, um, Turkey has a strategic interest in Russia losing, but is there anything significant about the timing of when President Erdogan said this? Well, I mean, that, that's, a, that's nothing new. Uh, mm -hmm. Turkey, starting from 2014, when Russia occupied and annexed Crimea, uh, Turkey does not recognize this annexation. It's outright. Uh, it's, it rejects outright. So uh, Turkey, and from time to time, Turkey officially expresses its, its opinion, its, its position in in, in in in in the Crimean issue that Turkey does. And Turkey has. I mean, there's a Crimean Tatars, a Crimean Tatar group in uh, in, in in Crimea. And they have some connections with national circles here, et cetera, et cetera. So for, also for domestic reasons, Turkey cannot ignore the existence of this problem. And uh, Turkey definitely sides with Ukraine uh, in, in, in the Crimean issue. Mm -hmm. So th there is nothing surprising here. And this is, I mean, Russia knows this. Sometimes they have made uh, nasty uh, declarations that Turkey has weaknesses, its own weaknesses, et cetera, et cetera. But Russia acknowledges that Turkey has different position, like in many issues, like in, in, in, in, in, in Syria. But both sides, both Erdogan and Putin, has learned over time to compartmentalize the, the, the, the, the thorny issues and they, they carry on with other areas where they can cooperate. I see. Compartmentalize is a word that definitely does come up when describing Turco-Russian relations. So uh, it's no surprise that it's come up here. Now, Doctor, yeah. let's end on this. Now, um, 
A few months ago, you wrote a piece that I thought was particularly interesting. You asked if the war in Ukraine is a war of the military-industrial complex. Now, at this point, it's undeniable that given billion dollars of aid to Ukraine, this has been a very good fiscal year for the defense companies. But mm -hmm. when we think of big names in defense sector, we usually think of Lockheed Martin, Raytheon, Grumman, so on. But should we start thinking about Turkey as a major chief defense exporter? What, your, what are your thoughts? Yeah, uh, Turkey has been, I mean, we didn't have this before. That this, this is, although the, we, Turkey had some, some background in this, but this is something quite new mm -hmm. that we're talking about a Turkish military industrial complex now. <laughs> there, there are some, some uh, important points that we should make. First of all, it is supported by the uh, especially the most prominent, most well-known uh, part of Turkish military industrial complex is the the draw drone production. That, that's quite famous. The uh, Bayraks and the, the Bayraktar uh, TB tools, and this you know the, the the relationship between the owner of the company and the, their you know, ties with with government with Erdogan himself, etc. But they they're there are some kind of a public subsidi subsidizing uh, for this company. And other than that, Turkey produces some, <clears throat> for, for, for some time now, I mean, Tur Turkey produces uh, military vessels, warships. For a while, it, it, it has been started in late 1990s. Uh, Milgan project uh, carried out by, by, by, Turkish, by the Turkish Navy. And Turkey has its own military aircraft project. I mean, which is controversial at least because mm -hmm. to what extent can Turkey uh, build uh, a military aircraft which is on par with with other uh, rivals like yeah. F F forty five etc. A fifth and generation they, fighter aircraft, no less. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that, that that's not something easy. Turkey has mm -hmm. has been producing attack uh, choppers, helicopters, mm -hmm. but. I mean, the, the engine comes from from the from the United States. Ukraine as, as well. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, as, as a beginner, I mean, the Turkey is new in this, mm -hmm. uh, you know, aviation. Uh, yeah. Let me call it. So it relies on uh, imports on sensitive uh, material, but you know, this is how it builds up uh, over the years. So we we can talk about a Turkish military industrial complex. Though in a limited sense, I mean, it's not, it's not, uh, I mean, we, we're not talking about a, a, a huge, enormous uh, mm -hmm. U.S. military industrial complex. I mean, uh, we, we can, we can compare it, but is it more like a rudimentary effort to, to have a domestic, mm -hmm. uh, military and defense production? And Turkey can, uh, Turkey is exporting uh, some of its, uh, products, uh, for, for a while. I mean, there are some issues that Turkey had, had problems exporting the attack helicopters to Pakistan, the Fortuna, uh, the artillery system to, to Azerbaijan due to U.S. Uh, objection, etc. But and, and, and we, we, we were talking about a Turkish military industrial complex, and it's going to be to be stronger in the years ahead. I see. Um... Look, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I do have a follow-up question. You said something very interesting back there that uh, kind of grabbed my attention. You talked about uh, Erdogan's son-in-law actually yeah. owning the company that makes Bayraktar TB2s. Yeah. Now, again, yeah. don't want to put words in your mouth, but do you think there is a little bit of self-enrichment going on in this whole Ukrainian war? But it's not only about the Ukrainian war, but in general, mm -hmm. Sad. I mean, uh, to uh, TB tools to to Poland. There are many countries who are interested in in in, in TB tools, and I mean, I think that the, the, the company is, is apart from the quality of the products because they're not too, they're not bad, and but they're cheap. So mm -hmm. I mean, it, it is a niche uh, product uh, in terms of military industry. Yeah, fair. Uh, and they have very good public uh, relations or commercials. Like they, they probably they made it uh, for uh, Fukuyama to, to write an article on that, so which draw attention of, of the of the defense industries and other people. So it, they, they made it a, a big affair out of the Turkish uh, defense pro production. 
I see. Dr. Ruzga, uh, in the interest of time, we'll say goodbye for now, but it has been an absolute pleasure talking to you, and I uh, look forward to if we, uh, if we can have you back on in the future. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Anytime. It's a pleasure. Thanks. Up next, Turks are having a tough time getting visas to go to Europe. What's known as the Schengen visa, which grants the holder entry to 26 EU member states, has been experiencing months of wait time and the highest rejection rates in 30 years for Turkish applicants. Many suspect if Schengen states, namely Germany, are tightening immigration policies given Turkey's dire economic condition. But that's not what the Minister of Interior thinks. Minister of Interior Suleyman Soylu believes that this is a concerted effort to make AKP look bad before the election. Interesting thought process. Let's go to the details. The Schengen Visa. A visa that almost all EU members and 26 European countries require from the Turkish citizens has been at the center of criticism as of late. In the first three months of 2022, the rejection rate for Turkish citizens has reached over 30%. And the application process sometimes takes months. Turkey has filed a report to the European Council Parliamentary Assembly about the rejections and delays. The report suggested malpractice in the use of the visa system and stated that the rejection rate was a mere 4% in 2014, which then jumped to 12.7% in 2020. Minister of Foreign Affairs Mevlut Çavuşoğlu said in a TV interview, We see these as steps to force the AKP government's hand before the election. In the upcoming days, our friends will summon the ambassadors to these nations and give them the appropriate warnings. If that does not help, then we will have to take appropriate measures. The most common Schengen rejection reasons are as follows. Missing or suspicious documents. When documents might not match the purpose of visit or when they are deemed suspicious, i.e. not believable. Insufficient funds commonly occurs when one doesn't show enough financial proof for the trip and way back home. When there is suspicion that the applicant may not return to their country of origin. For example, when the applicant is unable to show sufficient ties to their country of origin, such as a stable long-term employment. Insufficient travel insurance. The travel insurance does not cover up to 30,000 euros. And folks, tonight we end on a somber note. A few weeks ago, several engineering students on a construction site for an internship were pinned under a construction pylon when it was tipped over by a brutal storm that took over the capital. The construction pylon was unsecured at the time, and the construction site was previously noted for workplace safety hazards. While two of the students were gravely injured and narrowly escaped death, Hajitepe University student Ta Öztürk was pronounced dead. Here's that story. Ten days ago, a disaster struck the capital when rainfall and storms hit. The Ankara Center Construction Project, then hosting engineering students from two universities, experienced a catastrophic disaster when one of the construction pylons fell on three students, killing one and critically injuring others. According to reports, the pylons were unsecured and toppled over in the wind, collapsing on the students. Taha Osturk, a Hajatepe student, was pronounced dead at the scene. Taha, a model student and a member of the school's football team, is missed by his friends and teammates. Hayatımda ilk defa kendimden küçük birisini kaybettim. Zor, benim için zor. Ailesi için tahmin dahi edemem. 21 yaşında. Yani denilecek çok fazla bir şey yok. Bugün onu hiç hatırlamak istemiyorum. Çünkü cidden derin bir yer aslında. Ve bu sayede gördükçe, anılarımızı hatırladıkça <gülüyor> ailesim gelmiyor değil.
Yani burada eksi 5-10 derecelerde idman yapıyoruz. Yani çocuklar üşümesin diye, yani kendi yaşındaki arkadaşlar üşümesin diye kapıyı sürekli kapattırırdı. Yani bizim aklımızda en çok hani replik diyebilirsiniz bir e, kelimesi kalan kısmı şu kapıyı kapatın üşüdük kalmıştı. Taha 2021 yılının Eylül ayında takımda yapılan ilk seçmelerde takıma katıldı. Fiziksel olarak atletik bir yapıda, uzun boylu, Amerikan futbolu içinde gayet uygun özelliklere sahip bir oyuncuydu. Zaten ilk seçmede, ilk denemede fiziksel özellikler gösterdiği performansla e, direkt seçmelerde seçildi. Sonrasında bizim rukilik olarak tabir ettiği bir dönem var. Her oyuncunun ilk senesi e, çaylaklık olarak değerlendirilir. Yani çaylaklar arasında en fazla göz dolduran oyunculardan birisiydi. Her maçımızdan önce kesin çok büyük bir sakatlığı oldu idmanlarda. Çıt kırıldığım bir çocuk değildi ama bizim sporumuz kontak bir spor. Gerçekten sert bir spor. Stajıyla alakalı e, bir problem çıkmıştı. Normalde yaptığı stajın yerine ikinci bir staj yapmak zorunda kaldı. Bana söyledi bu abi ilk hafta antrenmanları kaçırma durumum var. Geçen hafta içindi. Sonraki hafta katılmam senin için sorun olur mu ağırlık çalışır. Dedim bir problem olmaz. İşlerini hallet. En azından gel. Niyetli staj onun öğrencilik hayatı, akademik hayatı için daha önemli. Sadece biz sporcu değil, ülkeye de hayırlı olacak insanlar yetiştirmeye çalışıyoruz. Stajında problem çıktı için zaten ikinci kez staja başladı. Ve maalesef bu ikinci stajda onun mezarı oldu. And with that, that's it for us on this week in Turkey. I have Murat Tursan. Thanks to Mehmet Tanverdi for news text and Kathleen Phelps for voiceovers. And a special thanks to you for joining us. Good night.